Coming up on Theater Talk. And I went up and I sang for Julie Stein. And he said, Greg, can you sing something else? And so I asked the, the pianist if they could play Time After Time, because that, that used to be my favorite song. Time after time, I tell myself that I'm... And Julie said, what did you say you wanted to sing? And I said, time after time. I'll play it, I know it. So he, he played it and I sang it and it was, it was just magic. And I said, you are so great. You just, you played that song so great. And he said, well, I should have, I wrote it. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, one of the uh, defining moments in my life in the theater was when I was about, I think, 13 or 14. I came to New York with my mother. We went to see this show. I'd never heard it before called Nine. And I think that's when I fell in love with the theater. I'd never seen anything in my life so elegant. I just remember swirling, elegant movement <laughs> set in a beautiful white spa and 21 gorgeous women in black. And that's when I began my love affair, my admiration, my great respect for our guest, Tommy Toon, who directed and choreographed Nine. Oh my goodness. And Grand Hotel, and my one and only, and the Will Rogers Follies, and has given me so many fantastic nights in the theater, I can't tell you. Thank Welcome. Thank you. Thank and congratulations you. Oh, on your, Thank and, you. And congratulations on your lifetime Tony Award. My this God. is 10 for you, right? It's 10. <laughs> and you said you didn't realize um, when, you, when they were doing the In Memoriam that your good friend Mike Nichols also had 10. Also years. had 10. That's something. He was my eternal teacher. Michael Bennett was my first Broadway mentor, and then Mike Nichols took over, and he just is still teaching me. Yeah. Yeah. from elsewhere. <laughs> right. Uh, well, welcome to Theater Talk. Um, just to get your take on, on the Tonys and what they've become in all the years you've been going, uh, you go back long enough when it was kind of a more informal sort of an event, and now it's become this yeah. big 6,000-seat Radio City Music Hall. Everyone's got 8,000 publicists and Anna Wintour on the <laughs> red carpet. Can you take us back to the very first Tony Awards you ever attended? Yeah, it was for um, my first nomination for Best Featured Actor in a Musical, Seesaw. Seesaw, yeah. right. And it was at the Schubert Theater, mm -hmm. and Alexander Cohen produced it. So it was a family affair. Mm -hmm. The Schubert Theater is not a big theater, medium, great, great theater. And he had stars at the doors greeting all the people coming in. I heard somebody say, beautiful as ever. And I turned to see who beautiful as ever was, and they were talking about Melina McCurry, and she was standing right there in feathers, <laughs> white feathers. And she looked over, and I went, oh, my goodness. And she looked, and I said, uh, beautiful as ever, just like a parrot. And she said, ah. <laughs> so when I was receiving, I, I won. Yeah. And I was receiving the award in the theater. You're so close at the Schubert Theater. It's right. not like Radio City Music Hall. You can just see in the half house lights are slightly up. And, and I started making my speech, and I caught sight of her sitting in the middle, and she looked to be outlined in black with all this white feather. And I ended up making my whole speech right into the face of Melina McCurry, and I couldn't stop talking. It was just great. And afterwards, I said, I was talking to you. She said, I saw you. I saw you. <laughs> Beautiful as ever. Beautiful as ever. What do you make of uh, how big the Tonys have, be have become now? I mean, it's great for the business. It oh, it's celebrates great it. great for the business. But, I mean, I kind of miss the more informal, more family atmosphere. Well, we're old-fashioned guys. <laughs> that could I like beauty and romance and uplifting. I, I, I do. I love that kind of show. But I also love this other thing. It's like Hollywood now. Yeah. There are the big studio blockbusters. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there are these independent films. The fun homes versus the American in Paris. Yeah, the once versus whatever. Yeah. The, the These crustier, more poignant, deeper feeling things. And it's just great. There's room for everything, for everybody's taste. And lots of people have both this that I love and they have that that I also love. You go for the deeper stuff, for the poignant, the, the complicated, what's speaking to us today, what's our angst. And they're addressing it in musical form, which is interesting, but it's a different kind of score. Yeah. You know, yeah, one yeah, is perfect. lilting melodies and sweeps you out of your seat and makes you dance home. The other one 
you have a lot to chew on. Very internal. Yeah, almost like straight play. Yeah, um, yeah. Reaction. These smaller musicals like, like Hand once. of God. I couldn't talk to anybody for two <laughs> days after I saw Hand of God. I just think that's an incredible play. It's wonderful. <laughs> Come on, kid. I, I can't. God. Hey. Hey! Do you know how easy it is to find someone's home address on the internet? <laughs> what did you just say? Fun fact number two, the smallest of cuts, the Achilles tendon, will cripple a man for life. And Stephen Boyer? Oh, yeah, the good excellent, heavens. excellent actor. How do you do that? Yeah. I told him afterwards, I said, what you're doing is the impossible. He said, don't tell me that or I won't be able to do it tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> it's magic. Theater now, magic. Now, you said last night, uh, uh, if I can remember correctly, you acknowledged your parents. Yes. And you Thinking said uh, and, and that they Texas encouraged you right away to be <laughs> in the musical theater. You see, my father's great dream for me was the same as every Texas father's dream for their firstborn son. They wanted us all to leave Texas, go to New York, and dance in the chorus of a Broadway show. Well, I was speaking with irony. I know, yes. I know. I was going to ask you, what did your, your parents make of little, well, you were never little, little Tommy Toon, um, young Tommy Toon, in Texas, falling in love with, with Broadway? Well, it was dancing. Right, okay. It was dancing, and both my parents were wonderful ballroom dancers. Uh -huh. They were not p famous. They were not professional. They, he would just take her in his arms and dance. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a flapper, and she taught me the Charleston. So there was dance in the Toon family house and music, of course. Mm -hmm. So the dancing was not an odd thing for me to be doing mm -hmm. and, and, and odd in my father's eyes, which was great because this is... Texas in the 50s, and yeah. that's just not the way it was. I was the only boy in my dancing class, and my parents said I danced before I walked, that I would be crawling through the living room down home, and the music would come on the radio, and I'd get up on my hind legs and, and it, you know, boogie, <laughs> and then the music would go off, and I would get back on my, <laughs> and crawl. I had really not figured out how to perambulate, but I was <laughs> choreographing. Where did the the theater, the love of musicals. When well, did see, that we begin? didn't have that. They, yeah. the, the shows, you weren't coming to New York like I was as a kid. No, season. no. And they, the shows weren't coming to Houston because they would sweep through Dallas, which is in the middle of the state. Right. To come down all the way down. Houston, Texas is a big state. Come all the way down there, it cost them too much money and there wasn't an audience. Mm -hmm. So I'd never seen one. So when I went to high school, the first day of high school, the counselor said, what do you want to major in? And I said, dancing. And they said, we don't offer that. <laughs> but maybe you should go talk to the drama teacher. And I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen a play. Huh. And I met this woman who was just changed my life. And she said, well, the first thing we have to do with you is you have to go see a play. Here's a ticket to the Glass Menagerie. It's at the Alley Theater. Do you think your mother can take you down there? I said, yes. And it was starring Faye Bainter. <laughs> and it was the Glass Menagerie. And the lights went down to complete black like you've never seen black and then it was in the round and then the lights came up and they were all in place and he started and took us through this memory and and it was magic mm -hmm. and we were in downtown Houston and we lived in the suburbs and I was supposed to call mom to come pick me up I was in a state so I just started walking <gasps> I walked to down Main Street to Buffalo Speedway and I kept walking and it wasn't night till I got home and I was just in a daze and they were worried to death what had happened to me. Huh. You walked all the way home from Yeah, I walked all the way home. <laughs> it was miles. How old were you? Uh, well, what's your first year in high school? So, 13? Yeah, so 13, yeah. yeah. Did you even know what the play was about? Did you understand the themes or you just haunted? Somehow I got it, yeah. Mm. And then, then that was it. That, that this was called theater. And I went, oh, my God. So, yes, I, yes, I want to major in theater, in drama. Mm -hmm. And then a little girlfriend of mine who had a car, she was a rich girl from the River Oaks, and, and she said, I'm going to go see a dress rehearsal of The King and I. Do you want to come? Great. <laughs> we went and we snuck in the back row. This was a community theater. And here was, it was like... Glass Menagerie because they were, you know, the lights went out and the lights came up and they were there and they were talking a little bit louder than people talk. And it was the drama 
But then they started to sing, and then when they couldn't sing anymore, they danced. And I went, well, this is it. It's <laughs> Glass Menagerie, right. but it has all this other stuff that I love to do. And that was it. And I kept saying, what is this? And she said, it's the king and I. And I said, no, but, but what is it? It's not a play. And she said, well, this would be a Broadway musical. And that was the first time I heard that word. Really? And it became, then the, what we had was, I started looking at movies that had Broadway backdrops. Right, right. You know, right. the milieu of Broadway. Stage door canteen and that, 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 stuff. that kind yeah. of stuff. And I, I was more interested, they would have a scene with the, with the main characters in the wings having an argument, but you could look past them at what was going on that stage, you know, that shot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see it from the wings, yeah. which is still something I'd love to give the audience in a show, the view from the wing. Oh, it's yeah. so different than the view from the front. That's right, because it's a tunnel. Because you're looking from the, from the wings. And the magic is so different because the magic happens at the edge of the stage. Right, right, right. Because I learned that from directing and choreographing. I'd get a scene all together right on stage if I was in it. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I never wanted to direct a show I was in, but sometimes it worked out that way. And I'd get it all right, and I knew it would be right, and then I'd have my stand-in do it, and I'd go watch, and it would be totally wrong. And then I'd come back and fix it. No, I'd fix it from the audience. And then I'd come back and it would feel totally wrong up there, but it was right for there. Oh, that's interesting. So it's that one line that separates the proscenium mm -hmm. from the audience. And that, when you cross that, there's a different perspective. <laughs> up here it's this, out that's there that. it's that. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. It's night and day. It's unbelievable. What, what brought you to New York? I wanted to dance in the chorus of a Broadway show. That was my dream. I remember your father said something about living high cotton. If well, before I left, I said, how much money would I have to make, you know, to get by in, in New York? And he said, oh, well, I would say, Bo, he called me, I would say that if you could work your way up to making $100 a week, you would be in high cotton. <laughs> So the first day in New York, I, I went to an audition, and I got the job, and I went to sign my contract, and it was for $90 a week. So I called Dad, and I said, I, I'm almost in high cotton. Now, what was that job? That was Irma LaDuce. It oh, was a right. show that had just finished playing, and then they were sending a, a road company out. Hmm. So I got my, my dream came true. I got in the course of Irma LaDuce, and we went all over the country. When you were in Irma LaDuce, you said... You didn't really have any intention of, intention of becoming a director. Was there a moment in your life where you began to realize what a director does and you think, that's what I can do? I always did it. I, we would play Cowboys and Indians at Barry Bradley's house and, and um, you know, Cops and Robbers at Jimmy Springer's house. And in my house, we'd play putting on a show. <laughs> and I was just naturally bossy. And so I just got the kids together and galvanized them. We put on shows. It was called The Patio Review. And we did about eight summers of the patio review on our patio and we would charge and then we would do, we would give it to the orphans milk and ice fund <laughs> we were a hit <laughs> <laughs> so it was there from the beginning the idea that you could see the i just made up shows yeah i want to talk a bit about uh two of your mentors you mentioned them uh mike nichols earlier but let's talk first about michael bennett yes he was my first he broadway first. mentor and um you tell a story in a book i have coming out in the yes, fall indeed um and what's the name of that book it's called <laughs> razzle dazzle the battle for broadway um but i want to give you to give us a sense of that place that was called the variety arts where you first met <sighs> michael bennett what that was the this epicenter that was the epicenter of broadway all things broadway shows auditioned well, no, shows auditioned in theaters, right. but they rehearsed in Variety Arts. Where was it? Okay, it's a parking lot right now, and it's across the street from the 46th Street Theater, the Richard Rogers Theater. Right. There's a parking lot there, right. Right. and it was like a six-story building. The Edison Hotel entrance is here. The, um, Imperial Theater? No, it's, it's, the, it's those, uh, the, the, the Tom Cruise... Oh, the Scientology. Scientology right, buildings right, there. Right, right. And this was here. Okay. Right. And there was this woman in there that did the switchboard, but she was really central casting. <laughs> she would say, I remember one day I came in. She said, you, you're a tall, swarthy gypsy type. Get over <laughs> to, the, to the Schubert Theater. They're casting Bajour. <laughs> uh, Peter Gennaro's looking for tall, swarthy gypsy, gypsy, type. gypsy types. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's the first time I saw Cheetah Rivera because she was the star of the show. And I think they needed one more guy, and there was a whole lineup of, of us. Hmm. And uh, she, I heard her say, the face, the face. She was talking about me, and it was cool that she liked my face, but I didn't get it. But Michael Bennett was in that show, but I didn't know him then. You didn't know him. But I met him in Variety Arts. Right. Variety Arts was, there, there was the rumor, and it became true, that Bob Fosse had a key to Variety Arts, and he could go there at any time of the day or night when the muse moved him, and we would be coming home for, later, we'd be coming home from shows, you know, dancing in the chorus, and we'd look up and say, Bob Fosse's making a new show. Oh, you'd see <laughs> yeah, the lights light on. Would, the light up on I the fourth that, floor. I think that scene is in, in um, all, all that jazz. Quite possibly. He goes in the middle of the night with his daughter into a rehearsal studio and he's working out dance movements yeah, in the he would just dance work through the night so you are going in the variety arts and uh, you run into this little little guy in the elevator I think yeah and he looked at me and said well who are you and I said my name is Tommy Toon do you think I should change it and he said not if you want to go around being Tommy Toon <laughs> I paused I thought and I went who else would I want to be? Right. You have to, you got to get with it. You got to get with what you've been given. So I decided I didn't want to change my name. People thought I should change my name. Because it just seemed too it's hokey. Too phony. Too, too yeah. phony. But it's not. That's your real name. It's my real name. So Michael Bennett looks up at you, says, don't change your name. But you're going to another audition, are you not? And he's working. Yes, I'm going. Um, Julie Stein was producing the opening show at Caesar's Palace. Caesar's Palace was opening in Vegas. It was going to be the biggest, grandest casino in the world and the opening show Julie Stein had been chosen to produce it and um, put it on so I was going up to audition for that because I thought it'd be so much fun to be a chorus boy in Vegas mm -hmm. because you get to wear all those famous costumes you know with the flash and the tails and the top oh, yeah. hats and I, the sands oh, this and the whole yeah you know, this would be great so I went up and auditioned and they said come back after lunch and you're going to sing for Julie Stein. Okay, that's one story. But so I'm going up. And he said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to audition. This is Michael Bennett asking. And he said, when you finish, come down to the third floor, and I want to see, see what... I want to see what you can do, and you, I want to show you what we're working on. I'm getting ready to choreograph my first Broadway show. So I went up, and I did it. And they said, come back after lunch and sing for Julie Stein. But I said, but I have to stop, I have to stop. So I stopped and I went in and, and he was there with Leland Palmer who was his assistant at the time. And I saw 16 counts of the most fabulous choreography I had ever seen to that, at that moment hmm. in, in my life. It was so great. It what was, was the show? It was called uh, A Joyful Noise. A Joyful, right. A Joyful Noise starring John Ray. Right. And it was, he was using street and country put together. And you still remember those steps all these many years? I know, I know that combination. <laughs> really? I know so, it. My body, my muscle, my muscles have that memory. I can do that step, for, not here. <laughs> I can do that. I really can. I wow. can do that number. It never left me. And then you didn't go back up to audition for Julie? Well, no, he didn't offer me, he didn't offer me a job. Right. But when after l lunch, and I went up and I sang for Julie, and that went extremely well. Yeah. That's another side to this story. Should I digress? No, go ahead, yeah. Tell us I, what Julie I sang said. my song, and he said, great, can you sing something else? And so I asked the, the pianist if they could play Time After Time, because that, that used to be my favorite song. Time after time, I tell myself that I'm, I'm so lucky. And he, and he said, gee, I don't know it. And, and Julie said, what did you say you wanted to sing? And I said, time after time. I'll play it. I know it. So he, he played it, and I sang it, and it was, it was just magic. And I said, you are so great. You just you played that song so great. And he said, well, I should have. I wrote it. <laughs> you, didn't re you didn't know? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I was a chorus boy singing a song that I loved. I didn't know Julie had written that song. So he, that, that, he said, come to my office tomorrow at 4 o'clock. And I'm going to have some people there, and I want you to sing every song that you know. I didn't know many because this was before dancers were dancers and singers were right, singers. Right, it was right. just coming on right. that they wanted the dancers to sing. The first show I was in, they said, dancers, move your mouths, but do not make a sound. Right. And then they had the, the big chorus of singers because you used to have 
16 dancers in 10 and 10, yeah. 20, yeah. 20 singers yeah. Yeah. to make that big, beautiful sound. So, so I went up and, and Betty and Adolph were there. <gasps> but I didn't I, know who they were. I know. <laughs> But later I went, oh my God, that's who, that, that's who they were when I finally met them for real. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy you suits. I'm going to send you to Buster Davis, who was his music guy, who kept, he kept Buster Davis under contract. Mm. And he's going to put an act together and we're going to try it out in the Catskills. So that, this was a derail, but at the same time I thought, I still got it better in case this doesn't work out. I, want to, I still want to go to Vegas. Vegas. So Michael sent Leland Palmer up to see the combination, because after we sang, then we danced again, and that's when I got the job. And Leland said, come back downstairs. And, and, he, and he, he said, I want you to be in my show. And Michael said, said that? Yeah. But I just, and he said, and then Leland got up and and did the combination that we had done upstairs. For Vegas. Yeah, for Michael. He said, this is, this is what he was doing upstairs. And she could just see it and do it. Right. She had that kind of mind. And she made, and she made a mockery of it. And it was, it was pretty. It wasn't top notch. <laughs> and then she said, would you rather do that or this? And then she went into that combination. And there was no contest. And one was for a lot of money. And one was to get to do this choreography with this guy that... Just, you know, he, he was a genius. And he became your uh, mentor, mentor and, and, good, really. and very good friend. Yeah, we were very close. And Michael had a strange thing. I don't know if I told you this when you were writing, when we had our interview on the book, but he, he was scared in the morning yeah. to go to rehearsal. He didn't, and there would be time to go. And he, oh, no, I can't, no, don't make me go, don't make me go, don't make me go. And I said, well, come on. Last night you were telling me what we're going to do today because I, I was kind of assisting him yeah. and also helping him get to work. Yeah, yeah. I he, believed he was a hard him. liver, Michael. I believed in him, yeah. And yeah. I was always safe from that. I always have a built-in governor. I guess it's why I'm still alive because <laughs> I was certainly exposed to everything. Yeah, yeah. But if I tasted it or tried it and it didn't, float my boat then I didn't, it didn't grab do it you. again yeah. yeah so I'm lucky that way Michael was afraid in the morning but then when you got to rehearsal I remember you telling me he'd be afraid to get when you got him to rehearsal suddenly he would just put on his baseball cap and hit it okay folks showtime that kind of that kind of a thing yeah it was the strangest thing I guess it's the insecurity of genius and he said don't use the G word <laughs> he would, he was, a, he was allergic to being called a genius, but he really was. Yeah. He really was. But apparently, when Picasso would wake up in the morning, Francois Gillot wrote this, she and Picasso's secretary would have to go and say, come on, get up, get up. You're Picasso. Go to work. <laughs> You're Picasso. <laughs> yeah. All right. Pick it up. Basically, that's yeah. it. Yeah, he had this, this aversion to getting out of bed and, and getting ready and going to rehearsal, and it was really hard. And I lived a... I, I think I lived about six blocks from him, mm -hmm. so it, I, I was always coming uh, to to get him going and wake him up, bring coffee and all of that. I just be, I wanted, I was just a volunteer to keep the genius on track. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, it was just astounding to be with him because he he'd go bananas at night with ideas, yeah. just out, and then in the morning he'd be afraid to go. I think he was. His talent was so fearsome that I think it, it frightened him. Yeah. But once he got there, he would, he would kind of go around and ho touch everybody and hold on to people. And if, if he, he was trying to get to something, he would just come up and, and hold you or, or put your, put, have you put your arms around him. He's, he would go like that and he'd say, now let me see. This is what I want to do. I do, 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 do. Okay. He needed, he needed that physical... Connection, connection yeah. with the dancers. Yeah, he would touch them. And then the magic happened. And then it would happen. Yeah. Very quickly, because uh, we did introduce Mike Nichols earlier, what was it that you got from Mike as, a, as, as another mentor? Oh, my God. Okay, well, the most important thing is I don't know. In the middle of something, if we're getting here with the show, and the and he said, Shall, so what should we do? And he says, I don't know. And that is the most important thing that you can admit as a director. Mm. Because you, p 
people feel, young directors feel, they have to know everything. No, 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 it's this way. But once you get to a, and there always comes the moment in a show where you can't go forward and you don't know what's going to happen. And if, if you can just, if you know, of course you know. If you don't, say you don't know. He said, I don't know. Well, the minute he said that, the room changed. And then someone said, well, I have a suggestion, yes. What about this? And the cleaning lady would say, he should just go over there and kiss her. <laughs> and it's who, and then Nichols would say, "The best idea wins. Go over and kiss her." <laughs> that is Mike in a in a nutshell. Yeah, we'll figure it out. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Tommy Tune, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, congratulations on your lifetime achievement award. Thank you. Ten, ten for Mike. Ten for two. Great pleasure having you. And please come back. Thank we just, you. you know, scraped the surface of Thank this fantastic you. life in the theater. This is great. Thank Anytime. You. You're, you, are, you have an open invitation Thank for you. that chair on Theater Talk. Thank you. <laughs> it's I'll all yours. Back. It's the Tommy Toon chair. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.